Okay, um, I'm Barry Stapleton. We are here uh, February 27th, 2019 at the Ward Irish Music Archives with Dan McCollum and Jeff Kazak. And our guests today is Gary and Julie Batani, um, who um, have been involved in the Irish and Scottish music scene for quite a few years. The purpose of the interview is the Midwest Irish Music Oral History Project aims to collect the music and stories of musical artists in Milwaukee and the larger Midwest so that they may be shared with future generations and their influence can be truly appreciated and understood. So welcome, Gary and Julie. Thank you. So mm -hmm. a little background on both of you. Gary, where did you, what's your personal history? Where did you grow up? I grew up in Milwaukee. I was born here. Um, born actually in the city of Milwaukee, moved to Wauwatosa eight years old, um, went to school in Tulsa, and then went to UWM, got a master's degree there, lived around the Milwaukee area, moved to Wauwatosa, and have moved back to Wauwatosa, I guess I should say, and have been uh, here ever since. And what was your master's degree in? Urban planning. And where did you work? I worked for uh, City of Milwaukee, City of uh, Wauwatosa, and then Milwaukee County. Okay, so you Tosa East or Tosa West? Tosa, Tosa East. Because that was, West, West wasn't there yet, was it? Or was it no, West was there. Okay. But, uh, well, we just don't talk about that. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and Julie, your background? Um, I'm from Iowa. I grew up in a little town in Iowa and went to school at the University of Iowa and then came up here, found a job up here, and then got started in my career here, I graduated in, with, in interior design and moved out of interior design very quickly into business and just had a number of different jobs with a number of local companies. And where did you two meet? Billy Mitchell Scottish Pipe Band. Oh, okay. All right. I was here a week and was bored. <laughs> and so I, they had a, a listing in the phone book at that time. And so I called and went down to practice and met Gary there. Oh, okay. We should, we should just tell a little bit about Julie's background when she got into piping. Um, well, you tell them. Um, the University of Iowa had an all-girl pipe band, bagpipe band, and it was supported by the school. It was a huge deal there. Um, and I... I tried out for the pipe band and got into the pipe band, and so when I came up here, I didn't have any bagpipes because they were fairly expensive to buy, and I didn't have any money. So, but I decided to to try the pipe band, and so I went to the pipe band, and then we found a set of pipes, and, and it all worked out for me. Great. <laughs> Was there uh, music in your family growing up, Carrie? No, not growing up. Um, my sisters were both younger than I uh, um, got in the piano, but that, that was actually after I was uh, beyond that point, put okay. it that way. And you, so, Julie? Um, there was music in my family. I played the clarinet, and my mom played, and my sister played, and you know, singing, a lot of singing and stuff, but, but that's it. No bagpipes. Okay. And talk about ethnicity, Gary. Uh, background. Background. Ancestry. Uh, well, I'm a mutt. Okay. <laughs> um, the name is Italian, but there's German, um, there's Swedish. There's some Scots back on my mother's side somewhere. Um, my sister found out that uh, there's some uh, Alsac Lorraine back there, which is, you know, it's shifted back and forth between France and Germany, so it's kind of all over the place. And you, Julie? Um, Tremaine is my maiden name, and it is English, Tremaine, Carpenter, Wilharm. So, so English, German, um, Brittany, I think that's where, where I'm from. Well, great. So now let's get into the... Uh Part of it, uh, where did you, when did you start playing music or when did that come to you, Gary? Well, I started with pipes in uh, 1969. Um, this is something I always wanted to do. Um, my mother tells the story that when I was about five or six years old, at that point in time, um, there was 
door-to-door -door salesman that came along trying to sell musical instruments. Uh, I never witnessed it, but my mother said that um, the only instrument I had ever expressed any interest in was bagpipes when the salesman came to the door. And he said, lady, now I've heard everything. And he walked away. But, uh, in 1969, um, I started at UWM, and um, they tried starting a band at that point in time. There was a fellow named David Meyer, um, who with one or two other guys tried to get something going. Um, it didn't last more than about a year, but it got me started. And from there, well, I can go into the, the background of pipe bands in Milwaukee. Yeah, that'd be great. Okay. Um, the earliest recorded evidence of a pipe band in Milwaukee was from, uh, that, that I'm aware of, I think it was from, uh, there were some Highland Games held in 1905, and there was a reference to a Caledonian pipe band. That's all I know about it. Okay. But uh, in uh, post-World War II era, a group started uh, a pipe band, it was known as the Canadian Legion. The Canadian Legion, as I understand it, was sort of a kind of like a VFW thing. Um, and somehow there was some kind of a connection with this Canadian Legion thing. Anyway, that they started, weren't around too long, but that morphed into the Milwaukee Highlanders in the 60s or so. Um, Milwaukee Highlanders were around and they were, um, I mean, I, I remember seeing them on the street. They were a presence. Um, in about 1970, there were, there was a certain amount of dissatisfaction within this Celtic group, strange as it might seem to some people. Um, and basically there were a number of the Highlanders and uh, the people from this um, UWM group that came together to form Billy Mitchell and we were officially organized in October of 1971. That's when we got our 501c3 status. And uh, that's where Billy Mitchell has been since then. Now, in that interim period, um, there have been other pipe bands in Milwaukee. Um, the Milwaukee Shrine has had a band for a while. Actually, there have been two Shrine bands in Milwaukee. One, the Triple I Highlanders. The other was uh, Lake Lodge. They both sort of exist to this day, um, although they'll tend to combine efforts to do things. Um, there was a short-lived short -lived band called uh, Milwaukee and District, which existed for a bit in maybe the 1980s. Um, Celtic Nations came along, they're still around. Uh, Shamrock Club Pipes and Drums, um, I understand they might be having a few difficulties right now. And Celtic Nations, which actually grew out of a, another rift within the Shamrock Club, Pipes yeah. and Drums, but uh, they're still around. And then there's the Milwaukee Scottish, which has been around for a few years. They kind of waxed and waned through the years. They were strong for a while, kind of barely existed, and now they're back. Um, they operate primarily uh, as a competition band. They get together and they do Highland games and they don't do much else as, from what I've seen. But um, that's kind of the background of Milwaukee pipe bands. So, so tell us about those early days of Billy Mitchell. How many, how many pipers did you have originally and drummers, do you know, or? Oh. I came in 73 and I, I think there were probably like six drummers and maybe 10 or 12 pipers. Yeah. Well, pretty good size. Pretty yeah. good, pretty it's, healthy size group, yeah. It's been pretty much around that size through the years. I mean, I think the most we ever had was 16, and the fewest we might have had was about nine pipes, and then, you know, three to four drums, and or as Julie said, six to eight drums at its maximum. Yeah. So things Drummers are always harder, I think, to find. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's it's the drumming is different, and some people don't like to wear kilts. <laughs> I don't know. Some men don't like to wear kilts. Okay. <laughs> well, pipe band drumming is a lot uh, a lot more intricate than 
rock band drumming for existence where they basically provide a steady, a steady rhythm. Pipe band drumming actually follows the music, so it there's a lot more. Uh, there's a lot more to it. We've actually, on several occasions, had uh, percussionists from the Milwaukee Symphony come over, and just hang around our drummers just mm -hmm. to see what they're doing. So it's more of an accompaniment than. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. And tell us about your repertoire that you would play um, with Billy Mitchell. Well, it uh, at any given moment, it's probably about 50 or 60 tunes. Um, it's, we change probably 10 to 20 percent of it every year. Part of it's maintained for competition purposes. Um, part of it we, we do three or four performances a year with the Caledonian Highland Dancers, so we have to maintain music for them. Um, we maintain parade music to do parades, and then we've got uh, pieces we do for concerts. Just, you know, standstill sort of thing. But those are more the slow areas of the jigs and the hornpipes and things like that. So. And then sometimes we've had to learn new music when we've performed with other artists down at Irish Fest or, right. or some other place. So we've had, well, throughout the years, we've, uh, we've been fortunate. We've opened for um, Rod Stewart. On a couple of occasions. Cut a record with Rod Stewart. Yeah, Julie actually cut a record with Rod Stewart. <laughs> Never um, saw it. I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was at Four Pipers from Milwaukee, went down to Chicago to um, uh, do some background music, but uh, I guess. Didn't make the cut. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Released. But we've played with um, see, Carlos Nunez, we've played with uh, Red Hot Chili Poppers. Uh, Andre Rao from his orchestra. Um, think of anybody else? No. And uh, tell us about competition. Competition. Well, we probably participate in uh, at least three games a year. Um, Billy Mitchell has competed in, uh, well, we won Champion Supremes a um, couple times back. Uh, well, back in the 90s, early 2000s. Um, Highland Games, uh, principal component of Highland Games are the pipe band competitions where you've got any number of different bands that come up and depending on the kind of music you're doing, you have a certain time frame you have to fill and then they have judges who will rank you. And Billy Mitchell has done well, and there have been times when the judges didn't know what they were doing. So. <laughs> and there's, there's different grades at mm -hmm. pipe band competitions. So grade five, grade four, grade three, grade two, grade one. Grade one being the top grade. I don't think there's any um, United States bands in grade one? Yeah, no, there are. There's uh, City of Los Angeles is playing in grade one, and there used to be one up in Washington, but I don't think they're there anymore. There's, there's probably about 35 or 40 grade one bands in the world out of an estimated um, eight or 900. Um, of those grade one bands, they talk about seeding the top 10 because the top couple are not the same as the bottom 35, bottom five. <laughs> But that, uh, when you listen to some of the top bands in grade one, you wonder how things can get better. But okay. somebody thinks they are, so. And uh, what is Billy Mitchell grade? What are you Billy Mitchell has been competing in grade four for the last several years. We've been in three. In the Midwest, the Midwest Pipe Band Association, there are about uh, 45 bands. Um, two of them are in grade two. There's probably about three or four in grade yeah. three. The majority are in four or in five or they aren't competing. So. And, and throughout the years, you've seen the levels just climb. You know, a grade the four band, the standards. A grade four band used to be a grade, well, I'm saying Easily. this wrong, grade, grade three, three band. No, the, the <laughs> sound know, and the kind the of levels. The sound has 
Actually, it's been said that the Midwest Pipe Band Association is some of the strongest uh, grade three and grade four pi pipe bands in the world. Um, well, it's been said. I have, yeah, I yeah. Know, but anyway. And you've traveled to Scotland with the band, correct? Or to where? We're, tell me some of your travels with the band. We have traveled um, around the Midwest. We've been into Canada. Um, the band has not gone to Scotland. Oh, okay. um, the Caledonian dancers, Julie was a dancer too for almost 30 years, did four, four performing tours of Scotland, and um, I was along as a piper for that. Um, but the band is not gone. Okay. Uh, it's a lot of money, and it's a big commitment to go, and um, I don't know how much of a tangent we go off on, but the reality is that you talk to the guys about going to Scotland and, yeah, it's a great idea, but if I'm going to go, I have to take my wife and kids, and all of a sudden, you know, it, yeah. the bills get yeah. big. And it's a so. huge commitment to be practicing, you know, daily or, mm -hmm. or with the group daily because, you know, you're only pay, playing, I don't know, three to five minutes, but that three five minutes you got to be spot on and your tone's got to be right and so it, it really requires a lot of effort and mm -hmm. and we're all kind of professional volunteers and, and for this mm -hmm. the band and it's just yeah. well I, competitive wise Billy Mitchell has had its days it's done well um, but as I was mentioning before the the top grade one bands um, typically are one of two types. They're either uh, essentially professional bands, which there are a few of. There are uh, um, police bands that, you know, they're, a lot of these ex-army pipers become uh, a policeman for the Midlothian police, which used to be the Edinburgh police, and they spend four hours sitting at a desk and they spend four hours a day practicing or performing. Um, they have this sort of professional background or there are groups that, um, good musicians that come together, work like hell for four or five years, achieve the pinnacle, and then fall apart because they can't keep it up. Um, it's just so much effort. Um, I've had friends play in grade one bands. I mean, these guys can practice three times a week for four hours a day, you know? And if you miss a practice, you can be thrown out of the band. Um, it's a serious commitment. And there, and there is a serious physicality to playing the pipes. Yeah. Um, you know, I've never played a tuba or anything like that. I can't make a comparison. But it's definitely a physical instrument. Um, it, it requires a certain amount of stamina. But to tell you the truth, it's more coordination than muscle. You know, learning how to get your diaphragm and your arm and everything working together um, is the key to it. Just tell us a little bit more about the pipes. The pipes, well, um, pipes are one of mankind's oldest musical instruments. Reeded pipes have been found um, in digs in the Sumerian city-states back, you know, 9,000 years ago. Somewhere along the line, um, somebody stuck a bag on a, on a reeded pipe and made bagpipes. Um, when people hear bagpipes, they think the three drone Scottish pipe marching down the street, but actually at one point in time, there were over 60 different forms of bagpipes throughout Europe. Uh, and as a matter of fact, uh, Roman legions were marching to bagpipes 2,000 years before they ever came to Scotland. Um, so they've been around for a long time. The sound, of course, has been different. Um, pipes, uh, the, the Scottish Highland pipe, um, it's got a reeded chanter. There's a short, fat, thick reed that looks like a noble reed, but it's, um, it's stronger. Um, you've got a chanter with nine notes on it. Um, some people wonder how an instrument with only nine notes can be so hard to play, but it is. Uh, and then you've got three drones over the shoulder. Each have a single reed, which um, the bag acts as a reservoir to keep going. Um, Highland pipes, once you start, they keep going. Um, unlike uh, Irish eland pipes, you can chop, stop the chanter and actually produce breaks in the sound. Um, but 
island pipes, for example, you can't. Um, I played Irish Ewan pipes for about 10 years. Um, it's a different instrument, um, wider range of notes. Um, fingering is different. Fingering is different. You play them sitting down. I actually um, reached a point where I had to kind of make a decision between Ewan pipes and Highland pipes because the difference in fingering was transferring back and forth between the two. And at that time I was competing as a solo a soloist in Highland piping and it was starting to goof me up a little bit. So I kind of moved on. But um, the, uh, the Irish Ewan pipes, um, you know, it's, a, it's a softer sound and they, as a chromatic scale, it plays easier with different instruments as I'm sure the the word archives have plenty of examples of. And so, um, tell me a little bit about the drums, the different types of drums you'd have in, in, the, in the workshop. Well, there's essentially three drums. It's a side drum, um, it's a rope, it's a high tension, um, they call it side drums, a high tension snare drum. Um, the tension is such that it doesn't take much to break the heads. Um, we've had any number of St. Patrick's Day parades where the weather has just been enough to <coughs> split the heads right down the middle. Um, they produce a higher pitch. Um, they're tuned higher, which produces sort of a distinctive um, sound. We also have tenor drums, which um, are pitched a little bit deeper and they're more of an accompaniment to the, the uh, tenor, uh, the, I'm sorry, the snare drums. And then you have a bass drum, which provides base, a basic beat. And a bass drum is, you know, every band in the world has got bass drums. So. And for years, the tenor drums, the, the biggest thing about them was people were twirling the sticks. Uh -huh. That was the, there Something wasn't much so. of a, a beat coming from the tenor drums. Right. Just. But now, I think through the influence of uh, competition, uh, tenor drums are playing more. They work uh, in conjunction with the bass and the tenor. And uh, over the years, the scoring of pipe band competitions has changed to the point where uh, tenor drums, or, I'm sorry, the drum section overall now um, has a much greater influence on the final score. At uh, one point in time, your score was based on, we had two piping judges and a drumming judge. Now you've got two piping judges, a drumming judge, and an ensemble judge that does nothing but listen to how the drums and the pipes are playing together. And there, that is where that whole rhythm section of the bass and the tenors have an impact. Pipe band technology, well, the technology of pipes has changed dramatically in the last 30 years. If you were to look at a set of pipes today and compare it with something 30 years ago, you wouldn't believe it's the same instrument. Um, there are PhD physicists who have written articles about the tonal qualities of pipe band chanters and how they can be adjusted to reach you know, that perfect harmonics and pitch. The insides of the bags have got the moisture control systems which have done incredible things to maintain uh, stability in the pipes. Um, I w you can go out and you can hear some field recordings of bagpipes from the 1930s and stuff, and the sound is enough to scare the enemy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it, it's just, it, the difference is incredible. So Billy Mitchell has been a big part of your life. Tell, tell us about that, uh, uh, the friendships, um, everything. What, what is it in your life, Billy Mitchell, mean to you? Well, I can't, I don't want to speak for Julie. Um, don't you go no, you go <laughs> I mean, if I had, I mean, I didn't plan on my life being this way, put it that way. But I got involved. And I've been in, I was a charter member of Billy Mitchell. It has been a big part. Um, I've had the, what, the 
the honor of being uh, the pipe major for a good part of the 30 plus years I've been playing with them. Um, how many? Don't tell me about two. Yeah, I know. 40. Gary. Yeah, I know. I've been, playing for, I've been playing for 50. I don't want to think about that. Um, I've met just an incredible number of, of good people. Um, got some great friends. Um, some of who have come through the band and I'm no longer playing. Billy Mitchell is um, fortunate. And I think part of the key to its longevity is that we've got a core of people. There's probably uh, six or eight of us that have been playing together for over 20 years. And you know, that, that, that makes a difference. Um, we all get along very well. Um, I think if there's another fortunate side to Billy Mitchell is that um, we just get along well. Um, we may have different political opinions or whatever else, but uh, when you walk in the door at practice, that's, that's all put aside. We're there to play pipes, and uh, whatever else is just superfluous. And, I mean, I don't mean to say anything really extremely positive about Gary, but, but he really is one of the reasons that Billy Mitchell has stayed together, because he changes the music yearly. You know, we get new music. He, he keeps encouraging us to get better. We're never going to be perfect, <laughs> but he keeps encouraging us to get better. He, he brings in things like the band never played with the dancers. Gary was the piper for the dancers. And he, he thought, well, the band should learn some of that music and should play that music because it's, it's, it's things that people don't typically play. There's, a, there's an art to playing strospes and reels and, and jigs and everything. And, and to play for dancers at the speed that they want it is another <laughs> accomplishment. So Gary got the band involved in doing the dancing. And for us, Billy Mitchell has come out ahead with this, and the Caledonian dancers have come out ahead because it makes for such a nice show to have the dancers involved and you know the band involved. And it, it we see the band people more often than we see some of our friends, and we see them more often than we see relatives for sure. Mm -hmm. And you know, so they are part of our family. And uh, we have a son, Jason, and he's 35 now. But he grew up hearing us play all of these tunes. And so he'd be sitting in the back seat when we'd be driving someplace, and he'd be humming those tunes. And he has made the transition into playing with band now. So, yeah. so that's you know, good that it can continue throughout our family, so it is. Jason started off, and we... He was never forced to do it, but we um, provided the opportunity when he was in about junior high school and encouraged him. And he took it up and he kept it going till about um, senior in high school. And then you know, he went to school and he kind of, he faded away, stopped playing for a bit, but then graduated from school, started working and decided he wanted to get back into it. And he's... Well, <laughs> we see him every Monday night. Sometimes that's the only time okay. we see him during the week. So, so yeah, but, uh, like Julie said, when the, we see people on um, weekly practices, and it's become a way of life. And sometimes I'll say that uh, this whole piping thing, I'm, I'm in the rut so deep I can't even see the edges anymore. <laughs> But on the other side of it, I mean, it's been it's been a great it's been a great life. I can't complain. Yeah. Uh, it's taken us to places that we otherwise never would have been. Um, we've experienced things that, um, you know, as a solo piper, I've played. I've had the opportunity. I've played for some um, pretty fancy weddings. Um, some years ago. There was the chieftain of Clan MacDonald. Lord MacDonald uh, made a tour of clan societies in uh, 
uh, the Midwest, and I had the opportunity to play for him, which, you know, is probably like, uh, I don't know, it's about the equivalent of being in a rodeo or something. Most people don't see it as being anything significant, but within the Scottish community, it was, uh, you know, it was a nice thing to do. So, so tell us about your other um, you know, Dale Wind and oh, your sure. other earlier years there. Well, it started. Um, Mary Lynn Geary had uh, taken over um, the Cashel School of Irish Dance. Now, I don't know what kind of background you've got on that, but as I understand it, uh, there was um, a, a woman. Yeah. Nash, something Nash, wasn't it? No, Nina Nash. Nina, Nina Nash, Nash, yeah, start of the school. And Shamrock, the, it was a Shamrock of Dancers. Okay, yep. Yep. right. Um, and must have been, what, the mid-70s or so, Marilyn Gary took that over. Then she asked me, um, once I was playing, if I would come along and play for the Cashel School, which I did, and it was at Highland Pipes. Um, for a couple of years, but then that kind of morphed into uh, Shoshana, which was basically formed to play for uh, the Cashel School. Um, and that was, John. but that, you know, it was John Maher uh, on the fiddle, uh, Jeff Keeling on Borum, myself on uh, Penny Whistle, and eventually Elon Pipes, and then... Um, what band was in there? Well, it sort of grew over the years. Dennis right. Saberi came along with uh, accordion, and then Dan Hasmanic on strings, um, uh, bazooki and um, banjo and guitar, and then uh, Carol Fabrits came along on flute, and uh, on guitar. I'm yes. sorry, you're right. On you're right. And Corey. Pat, Corey Clunk came along on flute, and then eventually uh, Pat Williams came along on. And I was there. Um, and you were there on mandolin. <laughs> now, there's a lot of names um, of people that kind of came in and kind of left. And at some point, Fishana sort of stopped being just a group playing for uh, the dance school and became uh, Gail Wind and started doing other things. Um, Fashana did a couple of competitions, didn't they? Yeah. We played I mean, they went to the fashions the and yeah. competed there and stuff. And, uh, and then Chuck Ward played with us for um, a Chuck couple did? of years okay. yeah, on guitar. And, and again, uh, this, this group was, uh, it changed yeah. you know, almost on a yearly basis. So, and, it, and initially it was there mostly to support the dancers, right. to perform with the dancers. And then as it changed to Gale Wind. It still did yeah. some work with the dancers, but right. then it played some pubs and Irish Fest and things like that. Um, and that lasted until about 1987 when um, it fell apart. Do you remember some of the venues that you played? Oh, played at Kit Nash's place. Um, the place on Juno, I think it's called La Harp. We played there. Um, there were a number of bars around. 35th and State. What, what that was Adonis. Adonis. Oh, Adonis. 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 Yeah. yeah. Um, um, there was a place down in Walker's Point. Uh, the post parade party was held there for a year or two. Um, the one on Mitchell Street? Is it the one on Mitchell Street, you think? Or? Well, the, the parade is on Mitchell Street, but I think the post-parade party was oh, okay. at a bar down right. in Wind Lake or something like that. Okay. I seem to remember yeah. that. Yes, I, I, I remember seeing, yeah, I know, I know where you mean. I mm -hmm. can't remember the name of the bar. And we played, uh, uh, I don't know. I, I, Stages and Irish Fest. Yeah, and there were some um, church basement kind of affairs that, and the dance school was involved with any number of things that uh, we did. Nursing homes. Uh, nursing homes, yeah. Well, I think one of the interesting things to me is back then, compared to today where there's so much activity, yeah. music, music and bands, that back then, even when Blarney started, there really wasn't Irish or Celtic bands around. 
right? Right. So you were one of the first ones. Yeah. Who else was Who else was out there as a band, an Irish band back then? Well, Blarney was Blarney. there. I'm yeah. not sure I remember anybody, frankly. Yeah. Um, and I'm trying to think of, was it Katrina? Was the other piper that did a lot of... Katrina Hill, yeah. She, she was uh, the wife of Gordon Spears. Tell, tell me about them a little bit. Yeah. Okay, Gordon Spears... Um, well, I can tell his background was that um, he he lost his mother at an early age. His father um, was in the British Army. His father put him into a, uh, essentially a boarding school for um, uh, boys that were going to grow up to join the Army, put it that way. And that's where he learned to pipe. Um, he joined the Gordon Highlanders, played with them for... I think 10, 12 years, something like that. Um, came to Milwaukee in the early 70s. He was working for um, Harry Humphrey's company. Um, he was here for two or three years. Um, he went back to Scotland for two or three years and then came back to Milwaukee for a couple of years. Um, the second time he came back, um, he brought his wife, Katrina Hill, who was the daughter of Bob Hill, who was a former pipe major in the British Army. Uh, so that's uh, Gordon and Katrina got together through piping. Um, Gordon and Katrina were both part of Billy Mitchell for a while. And then uh, one of those Celtic rifts yeah. happened, and they, eventually, they actually were behind uh, um, the pipe band I mentioned before, Milwaukee and District. Um, they had a strong drum section, but they never attracted a lot of pipers. Um, and they were around for you know, six, eight years, something like that. In the 80s. Then uh, um, Gordon and Katrina divorced. Katrina moved out east. Gordon moved west. Um, Gordon was uh, an outstanding piper, won a lot of solo events. I had the opportunity to work with him. I learned a lot from him, frankly. Um, Gordon and I, I was fortunate in my personal career that I started off with an excellent teacher, David Meyer. I had the opportunity to uh, work with Donald Lindsay, who was up until Oh, I don't know, the 90s, the only American to ever win any top prizes in Scotland. Gordon, uh, I'm sorry, Don Lindsay was actually uh, the pipe sergeant for the United States Air Force Pipe Band. The Air Force actually had one for a while. Um, and then uh, eventually uh, when Gordon came to Milwaukee, um, I was a pupil of his for a number of years and he taught me a lot about both piping and pipe bands. And I think, you know, Gordon was a, a marketer. I mean, he could, he could talk your ear off and he could, he could sell piping to people, I think. And so I think he did bring some opportunities to, to the piping community in Milwaukee. Yeah. Um, he got us involved in doing Chicago St. Patrick's Day parades. I, I think he, that was the first part of it, and got us involved with the the, distrib the beer distributors in Chicago and going around to uh, the yeah, different bars at St. Stuff. Patrick's Day. Yeah, I remember Katrina doing a lot of solo work. Yeah. Katrina yeah. did a lot of solo work. Yeah. Katrina, yeah. yeah. Let's have a, a follow up question with uh, the Gail Wind days. So were you, were you playing for um, Kaylee dancing as well, or was it mostly just the uh, company? It was mostly dancing? the school. Yeah. Um, I think we, there were a couple of events where, I don't know how else to put it, things turned into Kaylee's. People were dancing. Um, we were playing, but it, was, it wasn't like uh, the ICHC's Friday night mm -hmm. things or anything like that. And were there uh, any active uh, Irish sessions in Milwaukee at the time that you guys uh, were involved with? I don't think so. Nash's um, may have had yeah, we, open. Yeah, we played a couple times uh, open mic sorts of things at Nash's. 
Um, but as Barry said, um, it just wasn't that organized back then. Fledgling efforts, put it that way. Um, I should pause and follow up with one question. Two of them. So you'd mentioned briefly that you'd played with Rod Stewart on an album that hasn't yet to be released. Yeah. Uh, how exactly did that come about? Who were you playing with? And um, what's the story there? Well, I think that was a connection of Gordon Spears. That somebody contacted him from Chicago and asked for some pipers. Now... Chicago has a huge piping community, so it had to be somebody that he knew personally. And he asked for pipers to come down and do a recording session with Rod Stewart, and so we went down to Chicago someplace and did this record, and it was just one song. I don't remember what it was, but, but I don't think it ever came out. <laughs> So tell us a little bit about um, the relationship of the Scottish, tell us a little bit more about the Scottish community, uh, the organizations involved and stuff like that, um, you know, okay. societies. Well, the, the biggest society, if you will, is the Milwaukee St. Andrews Society, which is was formed in like 1840-something. I mean, it had its 150th anniversary. Um, couple of years ago. And uh, St. Andrew Societies, uh, the original purpose were fraternal benevolent societies. And these, the St. Andrew Society, and there may be equivalents uh, within Irish communities, I don't know, but they were essentially um, like insurance organizations. Um, members would band together with the idea if a member died, um, they would help out the widows and surviving children and things like that. Um, and at one point in time, it was, it performed a fairly important function before, uh, you know, insurance and everything else came into play. Um, these days, it's, it's essentially a social organization, although I think uh, if, a member's, if a member dies, they'll still send flowers or something like that. Um, but they're still going strong. Um, there's, a, there's a Burns Club of Milwaukee, which is not uh, 40, 50 members, something like that, that exists to study the works of Robert Burns, uh, Scotland's Poet Laureate. And they meet, I think, bi-monthly, and they have an annual dinner and things like that. There was, um, what's the name of that group? Existed for a while, the Caledonian Society, or I mean, there was oh, I don't, don't remember that, but. another rift within the Celtic community, a break off from the St. Andrew Society. They they existed for I don't know, 20 years or so in the 80s, something like that. Um, those are the three social organizations within the Scottish community. Mm -hmm. uh, Just one to mention that. St. Andrew's Society initially was you had to be, in order to be a member, you had to be a quarter. You had to have a grandparent that grandparent from Scotland. Okay. And you had to be a man to be part of it. So they've since expanded that because there aren't too many people coming over from Scotland who have, who have a grandparent from Scotland. So they... There are only a few native-born Scots left in the society. Yeah. Yeah. No, not so many. And they've also allowed women to become members About now. 10 years so ago they're, ago. they're kind of progressing just as, long <laughs> as many of the other societies and organizations are. Well, they even have women on the board now. So. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there are probably some, some of those early Scots spinning in their graves. Probably. <laughs> So tell me about the annual life of Billy Mitchell, and what are your annual events that you would play uh, every year? Oh, wow. Um, well, we're in sort of a... Well, let me put it this way. Um, from about September through January, um, there isn't much that happens. We'll play for uh, Tartan Ball in November, which has been going on for maybe 20 years or something like that. Um, we typically do the holiday folk fair 
um, along with the Caledonian dancers. I should mention that other Scottish community uh, organizations, the Caledonian Scottish dancers have been around since the late 60s, actually. And there was one other dance school in Milwaukee that was around for a bit. Milwaukee about 10 years. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. That was a pretty good dance yeah. place. Um, but, and then we'll do the, the Burns dinner in January. But St. Patrick's Day, actually, things start to pick up. May, June, July, August, into September. Um, parades, Highland Games, Irish Fest is always a big deal for us. Uh, we enjoy doing it. Um, I might say that last year I didn't see Blarney on the schedule, so I think Billy Mitchell has been at every Irish Fest, and I think we've we we've outlasted Blarney. Oh, yes. So <laughs> you're right. Yeah. But, yeah. but it's it's a great time. We've uh, we've taken the renting uh, upper decks when we can get them. We. Missed Don't, it this year. We missed it this year, so we won't be able to do it, but uh, we always make a family day out of it. And uh, the, um, the members come and bring their, their folks, their family, and whatever. Our biggest, uh, between roughly the middle of May and July, um, we're busy more weekends than we're not, uh, between games and parades and standing engagements and things. We uh, Talk of standing engagement, we've been playing for the Carroll University commencement. Um, it was actually the first engagement I ever, the second engagement I ever did with the band. The first one was a St. Patrick's Day parade. But um, Carroll University has got Presbyterian roots, and they've had pipers involved with their commencements since uh, 70s. the 70s. Yeah. So that's kind of a standing thing for us. Um, we used to do the circus parade when that was in town. Yeah. That Which was fun. Were, did you do the city festivals? Did yes, we did that. that. Was fun. Yep. Yeah. Yep. The circus parades were hellish, <laughs> to put it mildly, because <laughs> they moved at a pace of 140 uh, to keep the wagons. Oh, we don't move that fast. And, <laughs> yeah, and it was just hard. double time. Emerson's was the hall where they had the post parade party. Yes. yes. Uh -huh. That's it. Yeah, because I remember the first time I saw Irish O'Leary, and that was pretty amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so tell me, what, what's your favorite personal story uh, of playing music? Moment. You know, so. Boy, that's hard to answer. I mean, we've had some, we've had some great times. Um, I think of. Well, Carlos Nunez, um, and, and they're not, you know, the, the Red Hot Chili Pipers and uh, Dale Storm and the other groups we've had the opportunity to play with at Irish Fest have been great times, but Carlos Nunez was a real personality. And um, we had the opportunity to, um, well, when we rehearsed for Irish Fest, we got together, at, we suggested coming to the ICHC, which was very convenient, and afterwards, um, Julie and I, uh, Carlos didn't have a way back to his hotel, so we took him um, back to the hotel, and on the way he was hungry, so we went to County Clare, and we had uh, the chance to sit down with, for, with him for a meal, and he was talking uh, about life on the road and playing with the chieftains. Oh, that's, I had the opportunity, op two opportunities to play with the chieftains, too, so that's... Oh, that's uh, great. Nice. Uh, yeah. uh, Patty Maloney was... Uh, He's a character. Very nice. <laughs> <laughs> it was an experience. Um, but Carlos Nunez was uh, very much a gentleman, and he was just great. Um, I think, too, not to cut you off, but I think, too, when you're playing in parades, I mean, they're not, after 40 some years, it's not the most fun thing to do. But when the crowd really gets into it and they're appreciative of it, that really makes you feel good too. Mm -hmm. So you, you realize why you're there. Mm -hmm. Julie and I have had, <coughs> um, I thought you were going to ask my favorite experience in piping. Okay, yes. Yeah. Well, oh. meeting Julie. <laughs> <laughs> um, we aren't the only piping couple in the world. We've met others. Mm -hmm. But um, I think 
we may have been the longest surviving. <laughs> We've been married for 42 years. And, you know, as I mentioned, Gordon and Katrina didn't last. And uh, um, Bruce and uh, Julie. Julie, they didn't last. And, <laughs> but anyway. Oh, that's very nice. Yeah. So you talked about the development of the pipes. Mm -hmm. And um, you've been very, cons well, Billy Mitchell's been very consistent, as I've seen through the years, with the level that you were at and, and the size. And it's just always been, we always knew what we were going to get when we hired Billy Mitchell. No, I mean, that's, that's yeah. impressive. Okay. Um, but where do you see the future? Where do you see pipe mm -hmm. bands, pipe music? Where do you, do you see a line that's... Well, I can answer that in two ways. Um, okay. Pipe bands are more popular than they've ever been. As uh, I think I mentioned before, um, some years ago, somebody did some kind of estimate. I mean, this, this was around in the piping press, and I can't give you any specifics, but he came up with a number of over 800 pipe bands in the world. Um, pipers are in every continent, including Antarctica. Um, and piping has grown um, exponentially. Um, when I first got involved, if you had invested in bagpipes as an investment, you'd have outperformed the stock market in terms of what they're worth today <laughs> yeah, and yeah. what they yeah. cost back then. Um, and they're just the World Pipe Band Championships now is drawing top bands from. Uh, well, the United States, from Canada, um, New Canada, Zealand, Australia, Australia, South Africa, um, France, Ireland. The Irish bands have actually won the world championships a couple times. Um, all over, frankly. Um, you can go on the internet and you can Google bagpipes around the world. I mean, there are pipe bands in Arabian countries and Africa. They're just all over the place, frankly. Um, a lot of them, most of them are playing Scottish Highland pipes because that's what everybody identifies with. But um, they're not playing Scottish music. Um, it's all local adaptations. Um, it's become sort of a, a, a post-retirement Thing for uh, pipe majors in the British Army to finish their terms of duty and they get hired by uh, some Arabian prince to come down and train his pipe band. That's I mean, not unusual. Actually, uh, this might be something you might want to consider for the archives. Um, Brian Donaldson, I don't know if you're familiar with him. Um, he's uh, now an instructor out at uh, St. John's Saint Military John. School. Brian, Brian Donaldson is actually an ex-pipe major of the Scots Guards, which is probably the best British military band, an ex-instructor at um, the Army School of Piping, and he held a warrant as the Queen's Piper. Um, he's got quite a background. Um, the Queen's Piper, you, as I understand it, you have to be a pipe major in uh, the Scots Guards to, be, to reach the, the warrant, the, the appointment, but... Um, the queen doesn't have to choose you because you are a pipe major. I mean, she still picks people based on their, you know, their personality and whatever. And uh, it's, I mean, Brian could give you a much better explanation of the duties than I could, but I understand that one of the things is that uh, the queen uh, is awakened the bagpipes every morning. She, the queen's piper gets out there and plays for 10, 15 minutes, and that's... Uh, and the Queen, of course, uh, there's a Scottish family connection going back. So I know that... Um, but it, in I, Milwaukee... Let me, do, okay. let me just finish that the, the Irish and uh, the British Scots haven't always gotten along, but, uh, you know, I mean, it's a reality that I think um, somebody that's here in Milwaukee that yeah. you don't normally right. appreciate. Go ahead, Julie. But... But the, as far as pipe bands and in Milwaukee, I think 
that they're going to continue. I think, you know, it's not as, as strong as the Irish dance schools by any means, but I think there's a healthy community of pipers, and we're trying to, to train new people to come along. And, and um... I would, uh, yes, to get back to the point that you originally asked, um, I think pipe bands have grown, uh, piping has grown. Um, I think Billy Mitchell has certainly got a good future. I am slightly concerned by um, what I see as a lack of young people joining anything. Um, I've talked to people in other organizations and, and they're all sort of seeing the same thing. You know, people under 30, I don't know if it's, you know, they're busy paying off school debts, they're, you know, they're on social media, they're playing video games, I don't know what it is, but they just don't seem All to be, uh, I mean, it's, we, it's different today. Yeah, yeah we, we do have uh, a young piper, we've got a couple of young pipers, but it's not like, you know, there's eight of them that are being trained or something like that, so. And it, it's dedication, too. Yeah. I mean, people aren't, aren't dedicated to stay, sticking with stuff, it yeah. seems, anymore. And, and you got to do it for the love of it and what you get out of it. And, yeah. Yeah. That's something that actually, it's a tangent, I guess, but piping is something that you've got to want to do. Uh, it's not a casual instrument. There's this old thing about, uh, Scottish saying about seven years of listening, seven years of practicing, um, you know, seven years of listening, seven years of learning, seven years of practicing um, to be a piper. Well, that's extreme. Um, the British Army now, if you, once upon a time, the British Army, um, to be a piper in the British Army, they would recruit pipers, or pipers would join. Nowadays, they will take somebody that's never played, and in 22 weeks, they will turn them into somebody wow. that's, uh, you know, at a standard that they can play with a military band. They're not going to win the gold clasp at uh, the northern meeting, but they're capable of doing it. So the whole 21 years bit is a little bit false. But still, you've, you've got to have some kind of personal drive because it's, it does take work. It does take effort. So how many instruments do you play here? Or have you played in your life? Well, I did play drums in grade school. But uh, <laughs> I uh, came away from the dark side. <laughs> <laughs> pipes, um, pipes, uh, Elon pipes, penny whistle, That's squeeze great. box. Oh well, yeah, I did. Yeah, a squeeze box for uh, accordion or uh, yeah. No, uh, it's a concertina. Concertina, okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And you, Julie? Um, clarinet and pipes and penny whistle. That's it. Oh, mandolin. Oh, mandolin. <laughs> yeah. Did you have uh, any instructors for Elon pipes or penny whistle? Um, whistle, no. Um, I very little formal instruction on Elon pipes. Um, there wasn't. I had some uh, opportunities to um, sit down with some folks down in Chicago, um, but mainly, you know, it was going back, um, getting some of the the manuals that are available, taking what I knew from Highland pipes and. There are certain basic things about consistency and tone and things like that that, uh, that apply. But I did not have any formal instruction in human pipes. Have you kept records for Billy Mitchell and like your history? Or I know you got a website, but um, has anybody done an extensive history on that at all? There are bits and pieces. We have some scrapbooks yeah. of stuff. So we, you know, I, I know we have every piece of paper <laughs> in the house somewhere. <laughs> so, and any other important names from those earlier years in the development? Well, one of the, probably somebody who was more instrumental in organizing Billy Mitchell administratively than anybody else was uh, Jerry Caroon. Um, he was an Episcopal priest that was also, he was an assistant curator for the Milwaukee Historic Society. 
Um, and back in the, um, what, the 70s. 60s into the 70s, um, Jerry was a strong member of the St. Andrews Society. And he, along with um, a couple of us, um, the, the pipers and drummers, and, and to be frank, I mean, we were 20 year old kids. We didn't have the administrative ability right, right. to pull this yeah. off. Yeah. But Jerry knew people. Um, he got some initial support from the Ken Cook Company for the band um, financially. Um, he had he knew an attorney that got us organized, 501c3 and all that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, he was certainly a, a key component in making it go. He played bass drum for us uh, for a while. Um, I don't know. Can you think of any of... Well, he certainly had an impact. Gordon Spears had an impact. Um... There were people that certainly were significant members, mm -hmm. but I'm not yeah. sure you'd put them as. Thank you guys. That was a lot. Yeah. Yeah. That was oh, fantastic yeah. stuff. Yeah. Well, I, if you think so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you for your time. You're, You're welcome. welcome.